I was born in Beirut, Lebanon, to a Muslim Sunni family. And uh, my family were not rich. We were poor. We were just a good Muslim family. 14 brothers and sisters lived in a three-room house, kitchen, living room, bedroom, one bathroom. And uh, I thought as a child we were very rich because uh, riches to us was not about uh, what kind of things you have, but is uh, the, you know, the happiness that you live in. And I thought everything was perfect at that age. In my home in Beirut, uh, my mother loved me out of all my brothers because we had two teaching. Uh, we call it madrasa. The madrasa is one class for the boys where the boys were taught what is their future is going to be like and what they will be able to do and how they're going to fulfill their purpose and how they become leaders. My family, we loved Allah. We loved Allah so much that, uh, you know, my mother told me one day, my son, you will die and you will glorify Allah. You will bring glory to, 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 to the Muslims uh, and Islam because you are pure at heart. So here I am, I'm learning from my mom and I, uh, I was very simple in many different ways. So I was listening to everything she was saying and I was dreaming about how Islam will be established and uh, you know, worldwide and how Christianity and Judaism will be destroyed. Because, you know, in Islam says, you know, the final religion is Islam and nothing will be left on earth except the Muslims. So uh, I was thinking uh, in the matters of my mother's teaching. So at seven years old, I used to climb on the rooftop of our building in a cold night of Beirut, take off my clothes naked in a cold Beirut night where the water turned to ice at night. And, uh, you know, and uh, the rain happens, uh, you know, uh, vastly in Lebanon during the winter and snow happens as well. So and I used to roll in this icy water naked and crying out to my God, Allah, Rabbi wa Mawlai, if lam takun li famanli, Allah, my Lord and my King, if you are not for me, who would be for me? I was trying to please Allah and I want to have a relationship with Allah. Why I want to have a relationship with Allah? Because I dreamt that Allah would be something great that he will empower his people to fulfill everything he want them to do. So from that purpose, nothing happened. And I was coming to the logic. Nothing was happening except my fantasy. So I started fantasizing. And as I found fantasizing one night, I had a dream that I stood in, in, in a battle against the Jews and the Christians. And I was killing the Jews and the Christians. And uh, that day, you know, I was killed and I rose before the face of Allah. And Allah was laughing hilariously saying, only my slave Kamal can do such a thing to me. You know, so, uh, so that affirmed me that I need to do something to, uh, for Allah. So my mother now was rooting me in, in the ways of Islam. And my, the teaching of my mother, she said, my son, you know, uh, she said, if you kill a Jew or a Christian, your hand will light up before the throne of Allah and host of heaven will celebrate what you've done. So, and, and she taught me many things about the only way to please Allah is martyrism. There is no way, you know, you guarantee to go to heaven, except if you die for the sake of Allah by being, by killing and being killed. So it, it, the teaching that was taken me, it was, so poetic in a way, you know, to do the right things, you know, and even Allah in the Quran says, uh, That is in the Quran, he said, those who died for the sake of Allah, they are alive and prospering before the throne of Allah. So therefore, you know, I was dreaming and I was stepping into that future. Uh, my father, on the other hand, he was not part of this move. And my mother was the teacher and my, my father was working from sunrise to sunset daily and trying to really provide for us. So my circumstances, you know, you know, it fashioned my life to take me to the next level. You know, I was not smart like my brothers, you know, and so my dad one day came to the house and he, he declared he said, you are not smart enough to be uh, to go to school, Kamal. So therefore, you, you are going to uh, you have to work. Uh, bear in mind, I was seven years old. And he said, in, in order to live in this house, you have to work. 
because we have to make a living, all of us. So now, uh, you know, uh, I was going through the world. Uh, you know, I'm in my mind, I'm thinking, I don't know what to do and how to go about it. I'm a just little boy. I can't even, you know, say the ABC, you know, uh, you know, and my numbers yet. And so I fell on my knees and I held to his, I fell to his knees uh, and I said to him, Daddy, uh, give me a permission. Uh, I will, I will make, I'll, I'll, I'll be the best student there is and I will make you very happy and you'll be very pleased with me. But unfortunately, he said, this is, it's already decided. He, he looked at me down and he said, I wish you were a girl. And I, 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 I would have gotten rid of you by now and got you, you know, giving you away to somebody, you know. But he said, I'm, I'm cursed with you because you are not smart and, and, and you're a boy. So I, I don't know what to do with you. So uh, my life was so... Uh, coming to an end of this, uh, my childhood was ending and I have no idea what to do. So now I went to the working field and I was working six days a week from sunrise to sunset uh, and uh, walking on foot, you know, daily miles to get to work, you know, because uh, we were so poor, we didn't have money to, to take the bus or any other facility to go to work. So therefore uh, I was, uh, there's the weather that I was uh, open to, uh, harsh weather, whether it's summer or winter. And also there is the gangsters, you know, all over the area from the Armenians to the Kurds to the Shia, that which is, you know, I was Sunni. So I was beaten many times and uh, severely, you know. And uh, when I mentioned that to my dad, he said uh, it's part of growing up. So therefore, I didn't have a relationship with my dad. And my dad was disappearing. And now I have no place but to move forward and face this, uh, the, you know, the consequence and circumstance that they were set before me. And one day I was beaten uh, three times so severely by three different group that I ran to hide from the third group into a mosque. And when I ran into the mosque, this is when, uh, when a group called the Muslim Brotherhood came, uh, you know, uh, came and protected me uh, that day, you know, these men came and uh, pr protected me and came about me. Uh, and uh, so therefore, what happened, I became part of these people, they knew who my family were. And, and now I was growing into the, the most radical organization that came to replace the Ottoman Empire, only four years after the Ottoman Empire falling in 1924. In 1928 the, Muslim, 28, the Muslim Brotherhood rose up, and now I'm part of this organization, and now I've been trained by these people in the mosque and been radicalized into the ways of stealth jihad, which is infiltration of cultures, where you move into the culture and you change the culture from within. So now this is how my life is going, and uh, I'm, I'm part of these people, and uh, one day, lo and behold, uh, you know, a man, his name, Abu Yusuf, came and he spoke at our mosque. And he was the right hand of Yasser Arafat. And he said, Islam did not, uh, did not, you know, was not exalted by the word of Allah or by the Quran or by the Hadith. Islam was exalted by the sword. So if you don't have the power of the sword, you could not be, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Muslim that you are seeking to be. So the whole Muslim, brother, uh, Muslim Brotherhood group in, in, in Beirut, Lebanon joined the PLO. So now I'm going to my next page in life, our third page in life, which is going to, uh, you know, uh, camps being trained uh, as a little boy in Sabra and Shatila, you know, and in those camps, which is, you know, uh, they are a terrorist camp. And uh, now I found my childhood was... Uh, about, you know, the, the, the weapon that we have. I shot my first toy, the AK-47, at seven years old. And now I was transformed because I felt a new power that now no one can beat me up or tell me that I'm not a good Muslim or whatever. Now the, the machine gun can speak for me instead of me speaking for myself. So now I found a new family. I found a new power, a new, uh, new weapon, and my life was moving forward. And so uh, 
uh, I was selected out of uh, many kids and we were uh, sent on a mission to Syria to go through the Golan Heights and take weapons, you know, to and, and give it to the, uh, uh, the, the shepherds so they can take it to the martyrs, which is called Fida'iyin, and the, the Fida'iyin will kill Jews and be killed. And so therefore, you know, uh, our life, you know, as children, because the Israelite was, were not familiar with children terrorism at that time. So they will not, you know, see us as terrorists. So they will let us pass. And we only take an explosive guns and ammo on our back as, you know, little Bedouin uh, children, you know, with knapsacks on our back. So the first mission, it was really wonderful. And I was hailed as hero. But then, uh, you know, uh, now I became a recruiter. I was recruiting uh, other children from play, from playgrounds, from school grounds, from different places, ne- the different neighborhood, because, you know, you become famous. What you did for Allah, for Islam, for martyrism, that, you know, death did not take you. Now, everybody's, you know, look at you as, a, a, you know, just like uh, in, in a way of apostles or what, or prophets, you know, of, of, of that move of that time. So, uh, so therefore I was looked at, you know, regarded and many kids followed me to the point I recruited my next door neighbor, Muhammad, and I promised his mom, he's going to be alive and I'm going to take care of him. Only this time we were sent on a mission to Israel and I was eight years old, but this one was deadly. And when, uh, when, when we went to Israel this time, they hit us with everything. They were, they were waiting for us. And as we came over the hill and we saw all the sheep and the shepherd were slaughtered, you know, and uh, they knew that we were bringing explosive and weapon. So they hit us and those kids were taking shrapnel and bullets. And my, my, my next door friend, Muhammad was killed that day. He took shrapnel and he died too. And I was crying not you, Mohammed, because I promised your mom I'll bring you home alive because I was so worried. And uh, in my life, I never understood, you know, that every time I get in a crisis, this man in, in a white clothing will come and, and, and grabs me and saves me. And he saved me more than uh, several times, you know, during a uh, situation that I should have been dead. And I never knew who he was. And, and, and that day, uh, that man appeared and he saved me. And when the courage came back to me, I took Muhammad, threw him on my back, and I ran into the Syrian border to save his life. But that day he became my shield and he took every bullet for me, yet he saved my life. My life took me through many things in training, in missions, all over. Wherever Islam sent me, I was ready to give my life for Allah. But death would not have me for some reason. As I saw all my brothers uh, being killed left and right, my life for some reason was sustained. And I never came to understand why, because it, is, it became so scary for me that is, you know, uh, people who would go with me would die and I'm staying alive. And so uh, I did not understand the whole purpose of this. And I was growing up, and now uh, I got recruited by, uh, by you know, a, the royal family in Saudi Arabia. Our job was to come to the United States of America and infiltrate the sphere of influence and of power of the United States of America, from education, from military, from politics, from government, from uh, poor neighborhood, from jail system, from, uh, you know, uh, it just everything that that make America special from media, you know, banking system, all these are where, you know, the concentration of the Muslim uh, Muslim Brotherhood is to control those systems and bring about Islamization into this system. And and the Islamization was it to thrives uh, on, 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 on the strength and the weaknesses of the American Constitution. Did the Muslims succeed? Absolutely. We were very successful. Until one day, uh, I was driving in in my little convertible, uh, you know, uh, and as I was driving, this gentleman or this man, he was so on drugs, so much on drugs, that he didn't know where he's going. So he swerved into my lane, which is I was on the left side, and made me 
hit my brakes and go to the middle of, uh, of, of, uh, of the road and cross over. And lo and behold, an 18 wheeler was coming about and I was brown sided by an 18 wheeler and my little car literally exploded, you know, and just boom, I, it was just twisted metal everywhere. And, uh, it was just, uh, I came ejecting out of my car, fell upside down on my head in a mud hole, cracking my neck in two places. And I was crying, Allah, where are you? What happened here? This is not a way of the warrior to die. You know, my life is better than that. I was trained to do something glorious for you. But Allah did not answer. And uh, lo and behold, this man came and he was blonde hair, blue eyes, and uh, just came and he just was watching the whole thing. His brother was chasing the other car to, to take the number to tell the police. And he st stood with me and he took his shirt off and he dried the mud from my face. And he kept telling me, my son, everything's going to be all right. You hear? We're going to take care of you and everything's going to be all right. I never forget that moment because this man kept smiling and I'm, I'm looking at this man. Why would he do such a thing? And if he only knew who I was and then I arrived at the hospital, I'm in the ER emergency room and the orthopedic surgeon looking me over and he said the same word for word. He said, you have no family, no family. You have no friends. You have nothing whatsoever. He said, but son, we're going to take care of you and everything's going to be all right. My journey was leading me to the orthopedic surgeon home. And I had no choice but to go there. And now I'm in his home. And I haven't seen homes this big, except at the Saudi palaces and what so have you, you know, which is they have huge palaces. But here in America, this uh, doctor, and he had beautiful home, but and they put me in their choicest room and his three children came to the bed and climbed on the bed and start calling me, welcome home, Uncle Kamal. And here I am in, uh, in, in their home uh, and on their bed and I could not fight. And these kids, uh, you know, and I'm telling them to get off the bed because I consider them to be monkeys. I said, get off my back, the bed, little monkeys. And these little kids, they lay their hand on me and they start praying for Kamal. And the, the orthopedic surgeon gave me the key to his house. He said, Kamal, here's the key to my house. You need to leave because you're feeling so much better now. And I was trying to argue with him. I'm not feeling well yet. In two, month, uh, two months, I will feel much better uh, because I was feeling something so strong that I belong for the first time because in Islam, there is no uh, family, you know, that you belong to uh, if, if you're an apostate or what so have you. And here, these people love me unconditionally, knowing that I was a Muslim. And, um, and so he gave me the keys to the house. And then he said, there's a new key. And they took me outside and there was a brand new car to replace the car that I lost. He said, all of us put some money and we want to bless you. So we bought you this car. I went to my house that day and I was so devastated because I really don't want to go there. I, I was so scared, so afraid to go into the dark place that I came from. And when I went inside there, the first, the first thing led me is I fell on my knees toward the east, toward Mecca. There was a big window in my place and I fell on my knees and I cried out to my God, Allah, Rabbi wa Mawlai, Allah, my Lord and my King. Why did you do such a thing to me? You put me among Christians. These Christians have relationship with their God. They call him daddy, father. Oh, they cry to him for everything and he answers them. Oh, these these people are in love with him. And I can see his love over them. They're so prospered. Allah. Allah, if you are real, I want to know you. Allah didn't answer that day. 
I came to that place of emptiness again, that my God doesn't speak. So that day I was falling apart and I was between the two worlds, death and life. So I went to grab for one of my gun to finish my story. And as I came to grab the gun, I heard the voice. For the first time in my life, I never had the miracle of voice speaking to me audibly. And he called me by my name three times. Come on, my son. I am the God of Father Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He declared that he is a God of a family. And he loves his family. He said, won't you call upon me? I fell on my knees and I cried out with everything within me, God of Father Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. If you are real, speak to me. God of Father Abraham, if you are real, I want to know you. Well, the transformation, the voice of my father, God, Abba, Father, dissipated and the room was filled with glory. And that man in a white clothing appeared in the room and he stood there. And he was the center of all things. He was the center of all creation. Everything it, it revolved around him. The, the, the spirit of the Lord is upon him. The glory of God is upon him. The, the wisdom of God, the light of God, the, the, the presence of God. He is the presence of the living God. He's the invisible image of the living God. And I, my knower was opened up and I looked at his hand and his feet. He has hole in his hand and his feet. And he had a delete on his shoulders like the Jewish people. And I was going, my gosh, I knew immediately that he is Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. My face before him, I said, my Lord, my Lord, who are you, my Lord? He said, Anna Huada. He spoke in Aramaic. And I understood it. He said, I am he. He declared, I am the Aleph, I am the Tav. I am the beginning, I am the end. I am everything. I have known you, he said, before I created the foundation of the earth. Wow. I have loved you before I birthed you in your mother womb. Before I created your mother womb, I have loved you. This is God. My God does not speak. This God is speaking. And he came to my room, to my house. And there, in there, and, and he said to me, he said, Kum Kamal. So I rose on my feet. As I rose my feet, my neck was healed. My collarbone was healed. My ribs were healed. My hips, my knee, everything was perfect. But that was not the miracles. The greatest miracle was the transformation of my mind and my heart. I was reformed. All this anger, all this dark things that I've done all my life, it dissipated. It disappeared. And now I stood up and I was jumping before him in, 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 in just losing, losing it before his glory. And I said to him, my Lord, my Lord, I will live and die for you. I gave him my life. I committed my life to him. He said, do not die for me. I died for you that you may live. I said, my Lord, my Lord, give me permission. By the skin of their teeth and by their eyelashes, I will make them Christians. And the Lord said to me, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Be an ambassador of mine.